commanding officer of the 114th Regiment. Before I give my presentation, which I've been joking with some of my friends here, it's long because it's a nice cool evening. I figure it's more comfortable for you to stand around and listen. Uh, but before I give my talk, we are very fortunate with the 114th to have a number of musicians who come with us every Tuesday evening to the retreat ceremony and flag lowering ceremony over at the Lincoln Two. Well, two of them have been kind enough to come here this evening. On the left is Skylar Midden, our drummer. On the right is Andy Vandervert, our bugler. And they're gonna be playing a selection of Civil War tunes. Uh, following that, I will give my presentation. So if you will give them your attention, please, gentlemen.
thank you gentlemen for the music. I would be a bit remiss if I also didn't recognize Corporal Buckles here to my right, to your left. He represents the standard Civil War soldier, Union Civil War soldier. He's 22 years old, five foot eight, 148 pounds, with brown hair and brown eyes. <laughs> And the uniform he wears is, if there is a typical uniform from the Civil War, it is an appropriate one to the Civil War. Forage cap on his head. Western troops oftentimes would wear a black slouch hat. Gives you better protection from the rain and from the sun rather than the forage cap. His coat is either a New York shell jacket or an Illinois roundabout. It's very similar to the formal frock coat with the nine buttons, stand-up collar, except it doesn't have the long skirt. So it's a little bit cheaper to make, a little more practical, because that long skirt doesn't get caught on the briars and the brambles as you go through the bushes. He has a loop on the side to help hold up his waist belt, because that carries a lot of weight on it. Around his waist, he has on his right side a cap pouch for holding the percussion caps to fire the rifle. Bayonet on the left side. Also on the right hip is the cartridge box holding 40 rounds. In his case, 69 caliber, almost three quarters of an inch in diameter. Uh, it's an 1842, uh, probably rifled to take advantage of the modern mini ball but it's still a big caliber. The 114th were still using 1842 rifles through the Vicksburg campaign. It wasn't until the fall of 1863, winter of 64, winter of 64 before they were issued 58 caliber Springfields or Enfields. So two years into the war, they were still using roughly outdated rifles such as that. Uh, his trousers, kersey blue trousers, standard infantry issue. You'll see he's got corporal chevrons on his sleeves and on his pants he has a uh, one inch wide black or navy blue stripe to also denote that he's a corporal. How many of you have ever been to the retreat ceremony at the Lincoln Tomb? Okay, why haven't the rest of you been there? Uh, but any of you who have, you see how much smoke just seven or eight muskets put out. Multiply that by thousands, plus the artillery. The battlefield is covered with smoke. So you need some way to identify your officers and your NCOs. So your officers have unique cut uniforms, the shoulder straps. The NCOs have large chevrons, unique belt buckles, stripes on their pants so you can pick the NCOs out from the enlisted men. That's also why you have six foot tall flags so you can follow your unit on the battlefield and the overall commanders can figure out where their units are on the battlefield because of the use of black powder and all the smoke that that creates. So I wish to thank Corporal Buckles and Annie Vandervert and Skylar Midden for coming here and supporting me this evening. So they will stay around should you have any questions for them afterwards. Uh, please come up and, and talk to them. They would appreciate that. I'm going to be talking about the gentleman buried on the other side of this stone, Colonel Samuel Newton Shute. How many of you have done ancestral research? Okay, I, I really thought there might be more. But anybody who's done genealogy, who has done ancestor research, you're trying to take basic facts and basic figures and bring a true personality, a true person out of that. That was my goal this evening, was to try and find what I could about Colonel Shoup to try and make him a person rather than just a historic figure on the pages of the history book. For some of my information, let's see, where is he? Where's Chuck? Chuck Murphy, I wish to thank Chuck. He provided me with Colonel Shoup's service records from the National Archives and his pension records from the National Archives. 
So he sort of gave me the skeleton to build it all around. Once again, any of you who have done genealogy realize there are good times and there are bad times. There are times where you find out all kinds of information about somebody. And then there are also times you don't find out much of anything. And unfortunately, Samuel Shoup was a gentleman that I was not able to find a lot out about. No correspondence, no letters, no diaries, nothing that really gave you the who, the why, what kind of person he was. So my presentation is going to be a few facts about Samuel Shoup tied into the evolution of the 114th Regiment and what he could have and would have experienced as a member of the 114th during the Civil War. As handsome as I am, this is the gentleman we're going to be talking about. And I'm going to pass this around so you get an idea of, of who we are talking about. Samuel Newton Shoup, born in Piqua, P-I-Q-U-A, Ohio, a little bit north of Dayton in 1828. He was one of 14 children. His family, don't know how many, but his family moved from Ohio to Sangamon County, south of Chatham, in Ball Township. His dad was a farmer. Samuel was brought up as a farmer as well. In the early 1850s, he's now 20 plus years old. Maybe he wants to leave the farm. He wants to have an experience in life. So he goes off to Oregon for a couple of years. Then he goes off to Texas for a couple of years. And then he comes back home and apparently realizes, you know, life on the farm in central Illinois isn't too bad. So he sets up farming on his own and he marries Alice J. Moore or Maurer 18 November 1857. They eventually have six children, at least two, possibly three, before he goes off to service. On July 1st, 1862, Abraham Lincoln issues a call for 300,000 volunteers. The war has been going on for over a year, close to a year and a half. Volunteerism has declined. They're now asking for the governors to go out and encourage enlistment, maybe with bounties, with bonuses. 300,000 volunteers. Each state is given a quota. The 114th Regiment is part of that call up. Now you must remember, I'm talking August of 1862. The war has been going on over a year. The time of innocence is long gone. In the spring of 1861, after the firing on Fort Sumter, everybody thought the war was going to be over in 30 days. Oh, definitely by Christmas. And here it is still going on over a year later. Anyone who enlists in summer of 1862 knows what they are getting into. They have had friends, they have had neighbors, maybe they've had family members go off to service, come back broken in spirit, broken in body, or perhaps not come back at all. So the men who enlist in the summer of 1862 are making a commitment knowing what they're getting themselves into. And Samuel Shoup has a family he's leaving behind. We don't know why, because as I say, we don't have any letters or correspondence, probably to preserve the Union. He felt strong enough that the Union needed to be preserved, that he was willing to leave family the farm and everything behind to go off and serve. When he enlisted, he was voted by the men of his company as their captain. 
He had no prior military training, no prior military experience. But apparently his personality was such that they recognized his leadership ability, his managerial ability, that they voted him captain. Much different than the current military where someone goes through officer candidate school, formal training to become an officer. The Civil War did not have that luxury. It was going on too fast. It was on the job training for enlisted men as well as for the officers. So as I said, he's elected captain. He receives the great amount of $115.50 a month compared to $13 for a private and $15 for a corporal. But the officer is responsible for providing all their own uniform and leather goods, training manuals, whatever they needed. It was their responsibility to provide that for themselves as well as their own food. The enlisted man, their uniforms and food are supplied. Officers have to buy it. That's one reason why they get paid a little bit more. But after initial training at Camp Butler, the 114th and Captain Shoup head down to Memphis. Uh, they're in Memphis for a while. And what's all interesting already, in March of 1863, a little over a half a year after being mustered in, Captain Shoup puts in a request for a leave of absence for 20 days to come back home. Not to his family, but to come home and get deserters. There are stories that men have deserted from the unit, have gone back home, and are spreading bad words about the, the war, discouraging enlistment, and that sort of thing. So he submits a request. Uh, this is a copy of it, thanks to, once again, Chuck Murphy. It goes all the way up to W.T. Sherman. Uh, it's approved. But I wasn't able to find anything in the records that specifically said he left on his 20-day furlough. So I'll pass this around. You're welcome to look at it as you wish. It's amazing how even at that time the government issues a lot of paperwork. And it's amazing how much of it has still survived. So he, he possibly goes home for 20 days for uh, furlough to bring back deserters. Returns to Memphis. By this time, the 114th is now assigned to the 15th Army Corps under William T. Sherman. And they head south to be part of the Vicksburg campaign. They head to Jackson, Mississippi before. They're involved in the assaults at Jackson, turn back west, and are part of the assaults of the 19th and 22nd of May, and then the siege of Vicksburg. Uh, and during the course of the battle at Jackson in the siege, they have 20 men casualties. Part of what he has to do, once again talking about paperwork, he has to respond to the ordnance department and account for all the ammunition his soldiers spent, fired during the campaign. He has to account for 3,069 caliber bullets three cases worth <laughs> expended during the course of the siege of Vicksburg. And in one of the, in doing some of the research on the regiment, I can't remember who it was, but some poor lieutenant or captain in the middle of the campaign is being done by the quartermaster department in Washington. You have not submitted your paperwork. You are financially responsible for the shoveled axes tools that have been issued to you, and if you do not submit your paperwork properly, your pay will be docked for the cost of those tools. So here's some poor company grade officer out in the middle of the campaign being done by the bureaucrats in Washington for not doing the paperwork right. Some things about government and the Army never, never seem to change. After Vicksburg, the 114th eventually goes back up to Memphis, and then they become part of a special campaign under General 
Samuel D. Sturgis. Anybody familiar with Samuel D. Sturgis, what he's best known for? He's best known for a quote. He's the one who said, I don't give a pinch of old dung for John Pope. When John Pope comes east to command the Army of the Potomac, Samuel Sturgis, a West Point graduate, makes that comment about John Pope. He ends up coming west, and he is given an order by William T. Sherman to go out and engage Nathan Bedford Forrest. Sherman is very much concerned that Bedford Forrest on the loose will attack his supply line. He has one railroad from Nashville through Chattanooga down into Georgia. And any break in that line will end his supplies. And he knows Nathan Bedford Forrest is very active in that kind of action. So he asks Sturgis to go out and engage and ideally defeat Nathan Bedford Forrest so he can't go off and destroy Sherman's, Sherman's railroad. This is June 1864. Very hot, very humid. If any of you have been to Mississippi, like we were last weekend, uh, it's very typical, like our Illinois summers, hot, humid. They had just had rain, the roads were muddy, and Samuel Sturgis was accused of being drunk, as was, what's McMillan's first name? William. William McMillan second in command. The Union forces come up to the battlefield in dribs and drabs. Nathan Bedford Forrest is there and as they come up he keeps fighting them, fighting them and eventually turns the flank and the Union forces are defeated and forced to flee. And at that battle uh, the 114th went in with 365 soldiers and they had 239 casualties? 265. 265 casualties. Almost two-thirds of their troops were casualties. Most of them eventually were able to return. Uh, they were able to flee from Nathan Bedford Forest and get back to Memphis, but at first they suffered heavy casualties. Uh, the four of us and about a dozen members of the 114th Regiment reactivated this past Saturday were at Bryce's Crossroads and we dedicated a monument to the original 114th on the battlefield near the location that they engaged Nathan Bedford Forest troops 155 years ago. So if you ever go down to Memphis or to Mississippi, to Bryce's Crossroads, the first and only Union monument on the battlefield is to the 114th Regiment, and it was funded strictly by the members of the regiment itself. It was not funded by public donations. Technically, it was a tactical defeat for the Union forces. The Confederates held the battlefield. Strategically, it was a victory because Nathan Bedford Forrest was kept busy and was not up in Tennessee destroying Sherman's Railroad. Sturgis is removed from command. He is replaced by General Andrew Jackson Smith, eventually the 16th Army Corps. The 114th serves the rest of the war under A.J. Smith as part of the 16th Army Corps. Four weeks later, A.J. Smith goes out on a similar mission to once again engage Nathan Bedford Forrest. This time, the Union forces win the 114th and the other Union troops that had been at Bryce's are able to get some of their, their own back by this time defeating Nathan Bedford Forrest. So it's possibly the only time he really gets defeated in a stand-up battle. I think so. so, you know, the 114th had some downtime at Bryce's but had a good time at Tupelo. And this is from the Springfield newspaper at the time describing the 114th at Tupelo. Our troops fought for four days and were victorious every day. Captain Barry commanded the 114th 
until he was wounded when Captain Shoup took command. All the officers and men fought like devils and drew remarks of praise from General Smith and Maurer. The main body of the army will reach LaGrange, Tennessee today. So in the official orders, uh, after action reports, the 114th are prominently mentioned for the actions they did during the Battle of Tupelo. Normally, a regiment of 1,000 men would be commanded by a colonel. But as I mentioned, in June at Bryce's Crossroads, they were down to 365 men, roughly a third of their original numbers. Colonel Judy had retired. Major McLean uh, was sick, I believe. And command devolved upon a captain. For that particular battle, Captain Barry was in command of the regiment until he got wounded when uh, Shoup took over. But as I said, the 114th stayed under A.J. Smith for the rest of the war. After Tupelo, they go off to Missouri to deal with Sterling Price and his 1864 raid into Missouri. Then they head back to Tennessee. After Franklin, they head to Nashville under uh, George H. Thomas against John Bell Hood and the Siege of Nashville. And on the 15th and 16th of December, they're part of the assault by Thomas onto Hood's troops. And on December 16th, the 114th capture a Confederate redoubt. Uh, Captain Johnson uh, and his company capture a Confederate field piece, have the Confederate crew turn it around and fire on the retreating Confederates. But the 114th uh, is named once again in the after action reports for their action during, during the battle. After Nashville, uh, they stay in Tennessee, eventually go down to New Orleans, over to Mobile Bay to be part of the assaults on Mobile in March of 1865. And by that time, once again, the, the numbers of the regiment have declined. Officers have taken tremendous uh, decline as well. They have to elect a new commanding officer. It's not appointed by the general. It's voted on by the men. Uh, Shoup and two other men are up for nomination. And Shoup is named lieutenant colonel and John M. Johnson is named Major. So Lieutenant Colonel Samuel N. Shoup turns out to be the last commanding officer of the 114th. The assaults at Mobile are the last action for the 114th in the war. They end up going to Vicksburg, and on August 2nd, they are mustered out of federal service. They take river boats back up north back here to Camp Butler, where in early August they are discharged and receive their final pay. The local community is so pleased to have the regiment back that they hold a big dinner for all the men and for the officers. And for, once again from the newspaper, I quote, Calls were then made for Colonel Judy from Tallulah, who was the first commanding officer of the regiment, who responded in a brief and eloquent speech and closed amid considerable applause. At the conclusion of his remarks, the soldiers called for Colonel Shoup, their commander, who came forward when cheers went up for the gallant officer. He disclaimed any intention of making a speech and simply remarked that they were about to separate to their respective homes. They had been good and brave soldiers, and he trusted they would be good and law-abiding citizens, and closed with bidding them an affectionate farewell. So after that, as he says, the soldiers are discharged, ideally to go home and pick up the pieces of their civilian lives. Colonel Shoup returns to his family in Ball Township, Southern Sangamon County, picks up his career as a farmer. He eventually is a member of the 
Sangamon County Agricultural Board, and he is elected twice Sangamon County Sheriff, 1868 and 1878. Don't know how active he is with the veterans organizations, the Grand Army of the Republic, do know the 114th held annual reunions, and it would be unusual for him not to participate at some level or another, but I have not been able to come up with anything that specifically says he was a member of Grand Army of the Republic post, or that he specifically <coughs> attended any of the 114th reunions, but one would assume that he did. Unfortunately, in March 1886, uh, he is fighting a long <coughs> pneumonia-like illness, and on the 11th of March, he passes away. Funeral service is held at the Congregational Church here in Springfield. And of course, as you can see, he's now buried here at Oak Ridge Cemetery. In many ways, he is typical of so many of the soldiers of the Civil War. If anybody does research, many of them didn't leave letters or diaries. Unfortunately, many families didn't keep records like that. So unfortunately, many of the men who served, their stories are not known and maybe never will be known other than for the few facts that you get from their service records, from their pension records. I wish I could tell you a bit more about who he was, what sort of a personality Samuel Shoup was. Unfortunately, I can't do that. But he is still as deserving as all the soldiers in blue or gray of being remembered for what they did to preserve the Union and also to end slavery and emancipate the black people. So I thank you all for coming this evening. <laughs>